Hopefully, I have something recorded here. Okay, so uh, I'm going to go over some problems today, and I probably won't work them all the way through, but just going to go through some problems, talk about approaches and stuff. I picked out um, these are mostly from the the spring exam two, um, and we're going to kind of go through them in order. And as we go through, I'm going to try to review some of the concepts. We may or may not get through all of them, um, but I might just keep the recording going or whatever. Anyway. Um, so can you guys see that? All right, can you read it? Um, so we have a, a so starting off with a block on a block on a spring problem. No, nope, that's not what I wanted. That's what I wanted. And um, yeah, so we're given the mass of the block. We're given the spring constant and the initial compression distance of the spring. So that'll be your x initial. And we want to know the speed which tells us what we're gonna look for. Uh, once it has moved a certain distance from its initial point. So this is gonna give us X final, although it's not explicitly X final yet. Um, and uh, ultimately we have a spring. We know that a spring will store energy. And since I'm asked about speed, the speed tells me that I'm gonna want something to do with the kinetic energy. And uh, thus when you have a block, Compress on a spring and you need to relate it to a speed, you're going to use conservation of energy. And in this problem, we start off with this fully compressed spring. The thing is at rest. So that's going to be our potential energy initial. And then we'll set it equal to obviously, we have some kinetic energy final for there to be a speed. The other thing is, since the spring was compressed 0.2 meters and then it's only moving 0.14 meters, there's still some compression in the spring, which means there's still some energy stored up there. And that will be our potential energy final. This is how you want to set up these problems. Again, the biggest keyword that uh, I noticed here is speed. When I saw speed, that typically is going to limit me to uh, kinetic energy, especially with the spring. Uh, we don't really do momentum problems with the spring, except for that one homework problem, which is a little convoluted. Um, okay, so we have a half kx initial squared is equal to a half mv squared and the final squared plus a half K X final squared. And uh, yeah, so the last note that I wanna make on this problem, I'm probably not gonna work it all the way through because I trust everyone can sort of do the arithmetic here. You're given your K and you're given your M. So those are fine. We know our X initial explicitly right here. The one other note that I wanna make is your X final since we are moving from 0 0.2 meters and then the spring is stretching out by 0.14 meters. That means that your X final is going to be 0 0.2 minus 0 0.14. And I think some people got this problem wrong in the spring because they just plugged in 0 0.14. And of course, that's going to be one of your false choice answers. Um, so be sure to pay attention to that wording. Um, anything else that I want to talk about the spring? Uh, I think that's good for now. Um, Next problem, and I actually have two problems because there's two variations from the last two semesters, is where you're given an actual function for the potential energy in terms of X, and you just have a particle. So this is not, there's no gravity here, anything like that. We simply have a function given for the potential energy. And I'm gonna show you two problems. The first one here uh, is that we have a mass placed and released, and we wanna know at what value of X it will have its maximum speed. So I know that the maximum speed doesn't relate to potential energy. I know that maximum speed is going to have something to do with kinetic energy. And uh, maybe you wouldn't immediately see off the top how you can get from potential to kinetic. There's not a direct relationship. What we do have is we know that the change in kinetic energy is equal to the opposite of the change in potential energy, barring some frictional forces, which is like an edge case. And so we know that when potential energy goes up, kinetic energy goes down and vice versa. So if I wanted a maximum speed, since kinetic energy is one half times the mass times the speed squared, maximum speed would be when I have a maximum K, right? So, I know that I'm trying to investigate the time when kinetic energy is at a maximum. And since kinetic energy and potential energy have opposite relationships, this is the same thing as saying that your potential energy is at a minimum. 
since kinetic will go up when potential goes down. And now I know that I want potential energy at a minimum. Now I rely on my calculus skills. So I have a function for potential energy in terms of position. If I want to minimize that potential energy function, then I need to take a derivative. U prime of X will be uh, derivative X squared is two X, derivative of four X is plus four. And if I want to minimize this function, then I set it equal to zero and solve for X as I do in calculus and you'll get negative two, not even meters, I don't think. I think it's just uh, negative X equals negative two. Okay, so keep these tools in mind. Let's take a look at the next one. In the next one, uh, like this one, Nikhil, sorry, uh, that's actually a great question. You asked about this problem, I think. So this, this problem is, I think, question seven from last fall's exam, and it's exactly the one you're just asking about. Very identical setup, right? We have a potential energy function. Now, instead of asking us about uh, the maximum speed, they ask us when it's going to momentarily stop. So when this thing stops, that tells us that the speed is zero, which is the same as saying that the kinetic energy is zero. And we are investigating some other position where that is the case, which means that those are our finals. Our final speed is zero, our final kinetic energy is zero. What else do we know about the kinetic energy here? It's gonna be released from X equals zero. So that means that your kinetic energy initial is also equal to zero. Now, without panicking, just think about what this means, we're looking at investigating two points where the kinetic energy is equal to zero and go back to that relationship we had on the last page. Delta K is equal to the opposite of Delta U. Delta K is U final, uh, sorry, Delta K is K final minus K initial. If they're both zero, the left-hand side is gonna be zero. On the right-hand side, we have the opposite of Delta U, which is the opposite of U final minus U initial, which is U initial minus U final. And now I can solve here for something that might kind of look obvious. We wanna find when the potential initial is equal to the potential final. <clears throat> what is my potential initial if I'm placed at X equals zero and my potential energy as a function of X is two X squared plus six X. You don't need to write that back down. If I'm placed at x equals zero, plugging in x equals zero here gives me what for that potential energy? Zero. And I want the location where potential energy final is equal to that potential energy initial, which is equal to zero. So I want the other zero of this function. 2x squared plus 6x is equal to zero. That's where it'll be back at its initial value for the potential energy. And solve for the zeros of this guy. X equals zero is one of them. We were already given that one for free. The other zero would be when X is equal to negative three. Now, are you gonna get either one of these problems on the exam tonight? If you already get a problem like this, probably not. But in either case, you can work off of this Reciprocal relationship, it's probably not a reciprocal relationship, it's a negative sign, but you can work off of this relationship here. So long as energy is conserved, this relationship will hold. And uh, that's gonna be your way to attack this problem or something like it. Okay. Uh, yeah, okay, so this is a relative velocity question. I wanted to take another crack at this because this is one of the topics that confuse the most people um, uh, this semester. So we have a child sitting in a canoe, both the child and the canoe have mass, he's gonna jump off and we're given his speed relative to the canoe. We had a lot of problems about uh, relative speed on the homework. So again, I haven't seen the exam, but I'm just sort of guessing if I have four or five problems dealing with relative speed, we're probably gonna have something to do with relative speed on the exam. Again, I have not seen it. Okay, so here's our canoe. Here's our child diving in. Now I'm gonna take a step back here and show you how to derive the equation for relative velocity because I think a lot of people had trouble 
doing it themselves just from the shorter shortcut. Kid jumps in, kid jumps in with 1.5 meters per second of speed relative to the canoe. So let's think about what his speed would be relative to the water if we knew how fast the canoe was moving. If I knew that the canoe was moving to the left at one meter per second, and the kid is moving 1.5 meters per second away from the canoe, but the canoe is moving away from him at one meter per second, what is his speed relative to the water? Good, 0.5. How do we get there? Because the thing that we're measuring off of is moving to the left with some proportion of the speed. You have to subtract that out. Now, how would this actually translate to an equation? Well, we know that the speed of the kid is equal to uh, the speed of the kid relative to the canoe minus the speed of the canoe. So his actual speed relative to the water, you could say, his actual speed relative to the water is equal to the relative speed that's given minus the speed of the canoe. This, however, isn't enough to plug into conservation of momentum, which is what we ultimately need to do. We have to do P final, uh, or I should say P initial equals P final. P initial is equal to P final, good. <clears throat> so I need to be able to turn this into a velocity relationship, but I need to make sure that my sign conventions remain the same. I need to make sure that this one meter per second remains positive and comes out of his 1.5. So for the velocity of the kid relative to the water, we can say that that will be the speed of the kid relative to the canoe, 1.5 meters per second. And then we somehow need to indicate that the canoe's velocity is going to be negative. How do we know the canoe's velocity is going to be negative? Because right is positive x, left is negative x. I need to be able to tell this equation that that canoe is traveling in the negative x direction relative to the child. And so right here, what I need to do is I have to do minus the opposite of the speed of the canoe, which is in other words, the speed of the kid relative to the water is equal to the speed of the kid relative to the canoe plus the velocity, I'm sorry, the velocity of the kid relative to the water is the speed of the kid relative to the canoe plus the velocity of the canoe itself. Now, how does this become a plus? Because when I plug in my velocity, which is gonna be the velocity of the canoe is negative one in this case. When I plug in that negative one right here, then I'll have 1.5 plus negative one, which will give me the 0 0.5 of the kid relative to the water. This is how you could derive it if you needed to on the exam. Um, but in general, this relationship will work so long as this right here is the one that's traveling in the positive X. And this right here is the one that's traveling in the negative X. And you can just plug in your given and solve the problem from there. As a reminder of how the rest of this problem goes, the momentum initial for the whole thing is zero because it's not moving. They could tell you that it's moving with some initial speed and then you just have the total mass times the initial speed. And this will be equal to the mass of the kid times the velocity of the kid plus the mass of the canoe times the velocity of the canoe. And then we just make this substitution right here where we have the mass of the kid. And then for the velocity of that kid, we do the speed of the kid relative to the canoe plus the velocity of the canoe plus mass of the canoe, velocity of the canoe. And again, this whole thing is equal to zero, and then you can plug in the stuff that's given to you and solve from there. All right, so hopefully that'll give a fighting chance if you happen to encounter a problem like that. Um, okay, next up, I wanted to do uh, a straightforward collision problem. Again, this is the, the difficulty in this problem it just comes down to the signs. So we have these two masses that are moving toward each other initially. Uh, M1 is moving two meters per second and M2 is moving three meters per second. So what that means is that velocity one initial is gonna be positive two because it's traveling to the right. But the velocity for two initial, since block two is traveling to the left as indicated on the diagram, left is negative. And then they tell us explicitly that it's three meters per second, so it'll be negative three. 
In the final picture, block one has changed direction. So now block one is going to the left. So that means that V1 final is now going to be negative. And they tell us that it's one meter per second. So it'll be negative one. And then we do not know V2 final. That's the thing that we're gonna solve for. And so long as we mind our signs here, the problem itself will tell us the direction that that block is traveling. So how do we do it? Again, potential initial, I'm sorry, momentum initial is equal to momentum final, which means M1 V1 initial plus M2 V2 initial is equal to M1 V1 final plus M2 V2 final. You know, it's kind of long to write out, but it's important just to note that they both have momentums so long as they both have velocities. <clears throat> if these two were to collide and stick together, you'd have a single mass afterward. If they were to be traveling together and then they blew apart for some reason, you'd have the total mass initial times a constant, uh, a similar speed, velocity, I should say, because these are positive or negative. And uh, yeah, if you wanted to solve this problem, you plug in your masses and plug in your velocities. One times two plus two times negative three equals uh, one times negative one plus two times V two final. That'll give you negative six, negative four plus one, negative three. So V two final. Negative three on two. So how does that make sense if the other one is negative one meters per second? Like, what if they just like get it in? Uh, did I do my math right? I got the same thing. Like, how could the second one? Faster You're right that it shouldn't be traveling faster. Do you remember what the salute, what the answer was on the exam? Did you have to like submit it? Huh. Um, yeah, the issue here is that the negative one is unphysical, like they set this themselves mm -hmm. and they just happen to pick a number that is unphysical. Uh, that one would have to be traveling faster because of the speed. On the exam, I don't know if I have the same units as you, it's one meter a second. Um, but let's see, so negative one is negative one meter per second. Yeah. Is that what you were saying? Oh, I see. Okay. So this number combination is the issue. Um, I would stick with this. If you happen to get one where there's an unphysical relationship like this, I'm not sure if they'd end up giving the points back, um, but you are correct that two should not be traveling faster. Uh, that's a good question in the chat. Let's talk about that one. So Julia just asked um, about how this problem would be different if we had an elastic collision. Oh, no, that's not what I wanted to do. <clears throat> so same setup, but they don't give you either of the uh, final speeds. So what happens there? Uh, in that case, you're going to have your initial. So let's let's go ahead and copy down the initials. So we have M1 is 1, M2 is 2, V1 initial was positive 2, V2 initial was negative 3. And what happens if we have instead an elastic collision? <clears throat> I'm not even sure that we've done an elastic collision on the homework this semester. But an elastic collision is a special type of collision where energy is conserved. So remember, momentum is always conserved because conservation momentum is more fundamental. It'll always hold. Energy rarely is conserved. And if it is, then you have what's called an elastic collision. 
So in that case, you have two equations that you can use. You have the potential initial is equal to, uh, geez, the momentum initial is equal to the momentum final, uh, which we, we just wrote out in the last slide. The other equation that you have at your disposal is the conservation of energy. But here's how conservation of energy is gonna work for an elastic collision, because you're not gonna have any potential. So instead what you have is that your kinetic initial is equal to your kinetic final. And so you, in addition to having this equation right here, uh, yeah, whoa, no, nope, I didn't wanna do that. In addition to having the conservation of momentum equation, you also have this very long, you don't have to write this down, but you have a kinetic energy for each one of the blocks. You have a half and v1 initial squared plus a half and v2 initial squared is equal to a half and v1 final squared plus a half and, oh, and this, this should be m1 and m2, m1, v1, and then m2, v2 final squared. And uh, in truth, you can combine these two equations together and, and solve for a relationship between the squares of the velocities. Um, but uh, I wouldn't recommend spending your time trying to memorize what that equation looks like. But just know that if you have an elastic collision, then you can also add the kinetic energies together. And that gives you two equations to work with. That, that would also be a long one. Um, Oh, you do have a formula for elastic collision? I don't have the formula sheet memorized, um, but that's good. So they're saying in the chat that there is an equation on the formula sheet. Um, and uh, it's probably the like V1 initial squared plus V2 initial squared, like there's like a minus sign somewhere in there. Anyway, it's probably that equation. It just comes from combining this conservation of kinetic energy with the conservation of momentum right here. Um, cool. Try to get through some more. Nope. Okay, I'm talking about rotation. I think the rest of this is probably going to be on rotation. Um, and then at the end, you know, we'll probably we'll go through the whole 50 minutes, but we can keep chatting, keep asking questions, whatever. I don't have anything to do with this. Um, all right, so we have an object that is going to rotate uh, around a fixed axis. We're given the angular position. Yeah, okay, this is a good one given the angular position as a function of time. And then uh, we're asked for them actually the total acceleration. This is why I wanted to do this problem because a lot of people on the quiz had trouble understanding what the different types of accelerations were. So we have two types of accelerations. The first one, when we have an object that is rotating. We have the translational or uh, tangential. Ten Gential, translational or trans, geez, tangential uh, acceleration. And uh, this is the one that is R times alpha. <clears throat> this is an acceleration. If you have an object that's rotating around a circle, this acceleration points tangent to the circle. I usually just do a sub t, the t there standing for translational and tangential. The other type of acceleration that we have also has two names. This is either the radial or the centripetal acceleration. And this is given on your formula sheet as well. It has two definitions. The first one is v squared over r. This is how it was defined for us uh, back in like chapter five or six, I believe. The one that you will use for this problem though is the second definition, which is R omega squared. And what I also need to point out for this specific problem is that the centripetal or radial acceleration will always point toward the center of the circle. So we'll call that a centripetal. Now this problem asks us to find the magnitude of the total acceleration. The total acceleration is gonna come from the vector sum of these two. What is the angle between these two? This one points tangent to the circle. This one points radially along the circle. 
which means by definition, they will always be perpendicular to each other. So since they are perpendicular to each other, that's how you can find that the total acceleration is the square root of the tangential acceleration squared plus the centripetal or radial acceleration squared. And these are all A's, there's no alphas in here. The alpha goes in right there. <clears throat> you maybe don't need to recall this, but you do need to make sure that you understand which one of these to grab off a formula sheet for a given problem. Um, as far as actually solving the problem that we have in front of us here, uh, we have alpha and omega, and they give us this theta. So the thing that we're gonna need to do is we're gonna need to take two derivatives. So the first derivative will be omega, that's theta prime. Derivative of 2t is two, derivative of 6t squared is plus 12t. That will give us our radial. And then we have to take another derivative, alpha. There's the second derivative. Derivative of two is zero, derivative of 12t is 12. They give us a time right here. Plug that time in to find your omega. In this case, that's uh, 1.2 plus 2 will give you 3.2. And then they tell us an angular position at a distance of 0 0.2 meters for the axis. That's going to be your radius r. So you have your omega, your alpha. A general expression here is that this would be the square root of r squared. Well, you could actually just factor out the r. I'm not really sure that this is going to be beneficial to anyone, but you could factor out an r, and then you have alpha squared plus omega to the fourth. You know, anyway, you have all those given in the problem. You can solve from there. All right, two kids on a seesaw. You had a problem like this on the homework where you had maybe a few problems actually. Um, the diagram that they're describing here looks like this. You've got these two kids. They're on a teeter-totter. Here's M1 and M2. And... Uh, First one weighs 15 kilograms. Second one weighs 30 kilograms. And uh, they'll each have a, an acceleration. You could probably guess which one will go up and which one will go down. The lighter child will move upward. So that'll be a positive acceleration. The heavier one will move downward. That'll give it a negative acceleration. They're gonna have different magnitudes for their accelerations. Now, not given in the problem, well, they actually do tell us. They tell us that this thing is pivoted at the center. So that means that they're both located a distance L over two from the center. In other words, this is a standard playground seesaw. <clears throat> and the one thing that we need to keep in mind is that the, the thing that will be the same for both of these people, since they're sitting on a seesaw, is that they're going to have the same alpha. So it's alpha one is equal to alpha two. It was say angular accelerations because they're on this seesaw that is rotating around its pivot down here. Um, cool, yeah. So to start, I would start with the torques. I would jump right into it on the, the problem. And I'd say for each of them doing some of the torques, I'm gonna need to do RF sine of phi. Now the R is gonna be the same. It's gonna be L over two in both cases. Uh, the force in both cases is just gonna be mg. They'll each have a force of gravity or a weight. That is the thing providing the torque. You can call them weight one and weight two. <clears throat> and the sine of phi is gonna be sine of 90, which will be one. The only difference will be the, uh, the signs for my torques. So, the weight one from mass one relative to the fulcrum, it's causing the seesaw to rotate this way. Is that a, that's supposed to be an arrow. Is that a positive or negative torque? 
That's a counterclockwise rotation, so that will be a positive torque. So I will, I'm will. i going to put a plus sign just to remind myself it's positive. And then I need to do R times F. I said R is L over 2. And F is M1 times G. It's the force of gravity, M1 times G. The other child, M2, is causing a rotation in the clockwise direction. That is a negative direction for the torque. So we have minus, and then I just need R times F. R is again L over two, and F is M two times G. I'm summing these torques. We do have some rotation, so this won't be equal to zero. This will be equal to I times alpha. I'm given alpha explicitly, so that's tight. And I have both masses. And uh, ultimately, I'm trying to find the length of the seesaw. The only thing that I don't have here is the inertias, but I know that my inertia for point masses is just sum of the MIRI squared, which means M1 L on two squared plus M2. L on two squared. It's the same R's that go into calculating the torque. Always, always, always does that to be the same. Um, and let's see, what does that get? M1 plus M2 times L squared on four. So we're getting kind of kind of close to something that we can use here. Looks like we can go ahead and plug that in. Let's see what we do, what we have when we do that. So I have on the left-hand side, let's try to simplify this just a little bit. I can pull out an L on two, I can pull out a G. So I have L, G on two. What's left over inside is M1 minus M2. I'm just sort of condensed my left-hand side. On my right-hand side, I have L squared. I have my alpha on four, and then I have M1 plus M2. And what do I know here? Well, I know G is 9.8. I know alpha right here. And I know both of my masses. The only unknown here is L. You'll notice that you have an L and an L squared. That gives you an erroneous answer of L equals zero, which doesn't mean anything. And then uh, you'd solve for your other L value, and that would give you the answer. So for a what happens to the sign at the end? Yes, so the yeah, so I kind of breeze through that, but yeah, in this case, it would be sine of 90. So this the, the true answer is that this alpha probably only holds for the moment when the seesaw is level to the ground. And then as it rotates, your alpha is going to change. That's what makes a seesaw fun, that your alpha changes as you go up and down. Um, but yeah, that's kind of like very heavily implied by the problem. Um, but generally, for, for a like parallel beam problem or a seesaw, I don't want to say every time, but generally, your forces will be at an angle unless you have like, which we'll do in just a second, the bar with the rope problem, where they like explicitly define an angle. Um, let's see. Uh, yeah, L would be in meters. You'll notice that they just ask for the answer in meters, so you end up just giving a, a value, a number. Um, question about the word pivot. Do we do torque every time there's a pivot? Um, I mean, if you have forces with a pivot, forces is related to torque, right? Because torque is RF. So I know that those two are related. A pivot just tells you that you have some point that rotation is occurring around. We know that there are other things to do with rotation though, right? We have our theta and we have omega. And from omega, we can relate this to angular momentum now and conservation of angular momentum. So just because there's a pivot doesn't mean necessarily that you're doing torques, but it's a pretty safe bet that, uh, that this type of setup, especially like a seesaw or a, a parallel beam or something like that, we're generally doing torques with that problem. Okay, um, another one, another problem that, that I think uh, maybe I don't know, gives some people some trouble on the quiz, but I just want to sort of review these. I think that this is uh, this problem shows up enough 
and there's a short enough cut to get the correct answer that I just want to go over them. So we have, I think it's three point particles located in the XY plane. So dot, 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 whatever. Wherever they're located, they have different masses. And they're just going to ask us to find the rotational inertia about one of the axes. So you have three problems on the homework. I just want to review just real quick how I find the inertias for each. In every case, the inertia about a set of point masses is sum of the mi ri squared. When I'm in the xy plane looking for the rotational inertia about an axis, this is going to simplify quite a bit. So if I want the inertia about the x axis, since the distance of each of these points from this x axis is actually the same as the y coordinate. Nope. Since it's the same as the y coordinate, that means that the inertia about the x-axis is the sum of the mi y sub i squared. Notice that the inertia around the x-axis depends on the y coordinate. Similarly, the inertia about the y-axis is the sum of the mi x i squared. The distance from the y-axis is the x-coordinate of the point. The other one that you had on your homework was the inertia about the z-axis, supposed to be in line. The inertia about the z-axis, since the z-axis is through the origin pointing out of the page, it could also be the inertia about the origin. In that case, you have the sum of the mi's times x sub i squared plus y sub i squared. Or alternatively, you add these two together. That's just how the math happens to work out. Um, one other, come on, where did we go? What are we doing here? Tense. Is that one? Um, fine. Uh, one other thing to be aware of is that they could ask you to find the inertia about some other line that's parallel to these or about some other. Um, point that points on the page, but is still in the XY plane. In any case, what you could do is you can just adjust, for instance, if they ask you to find the inertia about the line X equals five. In that case, I'd still use this first formula. I just, each of my Y coordinates would have to be adjusted by whatever the, the Y coordinate is minus whatever this line happens to be. So in this case, it would just be y sub i minus five. Um, and same thing if they give you a point, then you'd uh, adjust each of the x and the y by just subtracting off the coordinates of the x and the y from that point. Um, cool. Other thing I wanted to go over, solid ball rolling. When uh, you have a solid ball or a cylinder or whatever, um, I mentioned that there are uh, rolling kinetic energies. And typically, I, th I think most people, once you understand that you have rolling kinetic energy, then you know it's just a typical conservation of energy problem. So in this case, for instance, we have a ball that is rolling. That's supposed to be a circle. And it's going to roll. And then it's going to hit a ramp. And it's going to go up to some height. And up at the height, it's going to stop. So I know that I have kinetic energy initial is equal to potential energy final. It'll be something mv squared is equal to mgy, and I just need to find y, right? That part of the problem is not too difficult. The only thing that has some difficulty in it is figuring out what the hell to plug in for the kinetic energy initial. So I've gone over how to do these, but I want to give you kind of a general approach for any object with any inertia that's given. In general, the rolling kinetic energy is going to be equal to, stick with me here, one half plus one half times the inertia coefficient times mv squared. This is a shortcut. This comes from doing one half mv squared plus one half i omega squared. This is how you can generate the rolling kinetic energies for any one of these objects. I will now go ahead and tell them to you, although you probably don't have enough time at this point to memorize them. 
but let's talk about each of them. For the solid cylinder, I have one half plus one half times the coefficient, which is also one half. So that's one half plus one fourth. So the rolling kinetic energy will be three fourths mv squared. If they ask you something about omega, you just replace v with r omega. A hoop, the inertia there has a coefficient of one. So I have one half plus one half times one, which gives me a kinetic energy of one half plus one half. So it's just mv squared. A thin rod about an axis perpendicular to its center will not roll. So you don't need to worry about a rolling kinetic energy for that because you'd just be rolling like this, which doesn't mean anything. <clears throat> for the solid sphere, we have a half plus a half times two fifths. One half times two fifths gives you a fifth. A half plus a fifth gives you seven tenths mv squared. For the thin spherical shell, a half times that two thirds gives you one third. So you have a half plus a third, which will give you five six mv squared. I've listed them here. So if you would like to write them down and spend a little bit of time trying to commit them all to memory, you can. Here's a general formula for you. And then of course, the even more general approach is that the rolling kinetic energy is a half mv squared plus a half i omega squared. If worse comes to worse, on the exam, that's how you can get the one half times the I coefficient that comes from right here. And then uh, hopefully you can get that kinetic energy out. Okay, how are we on time? Got a few more minutes. Um, ah, yeah, okay. Uh, Merry-go-round, you have a child on the edge and then the child's gonna crawl toward the center. And we wanna know the new angular velocity. This is a problem that comes up a lot. There's also like a cockroach problem that you'll see on old exams. We start off, we're rotating, there's something at the edge, and then that thing at the edge is going to move toward the center as the thing continues to rotate. What's going on here is that the uh, momentum of this whole system is being conserved, but the inertia changes as this object moves because that object is, uh, is technically a point mass with an inertia of mr squared. As that object changes its r, it changes its inertia. So what will be constant here is we'll know that L initial is equal to L final. This is just conservation momentum, but for rotation. And that means that I initial omega initial is equal to I final omega final. Our initial, uh, rotational inertia, we have a uniform disk with a mass mr, a mass m, a radius r. So for a uniform disk is something else we need to review. Uniform disk is also a solid cylinder. So it's also a half mr squared. So we have one half mr squared. The child has negligible size and mass m. Uh, so that will just be a little m times r squared. Why is the little r equal to the big R? Because the child is sitting near the rim. And we're told the initial angular velocity is just omega. What is our final rotational inertia? We still have one half big M big R squared because that's for the whole rotating merry-go-round. But now, since the child has crawled to the center, we have plus zero. I'm putting plus zero there as a placeholder because they could just as easily in this problem tell you the child crawls halfway to the center, and then you have to do m times r on two squared. Anyway, we multiply this by omega final, and then we simply need to solve for omega final in terms of omega initial. <clears throat> and that's going to give us, let's see, we can cancel out our r squareds we'll have omega final is equal to a half times big M plus little m over a half times big M times that constant omega. And then I believe they, they simplified it a little bit. I think they canceled one half times big M out in the top and bottom maybe. There were a few different answers. All the answers were in terms of big M and little m. 
So you might need to do a little bit of simplification on the actual exam. Okay, I've got two more problems in four more minutes. So we're probably gonna go a little bit over. Feel free to dip out if you want. Um, I'll try to post up this recording uh, within an hour or so. Uh, torque problems, we're gonna do two torque problems. <clears throat> First one, we have a plank. The plank is given a mass and uh, it has a, a length as well. And there's gonna be a pivot here that's placed not at the center. So you have a pivot placed toward the left edge. And then you also have a mass that's placed on top of it. What are our forces here? We have the weight of that block. We also have the force of the pivot, F sub P. We also have the weight of the plank itself. So we should have the weight of the mass M. Since the pivot is to the left of the center mass of the plank, the actual weight of the plank will be to the right of that pivot. We'll talk about exactly where in just one second. Now I have forces, this thing is going to balance. So when it balances, that means that alpha is equal to zero. That's very important. We're in static equilibrium. We can do the sum of the forces. That would actually be very quick to do in your head. Sum of the forces in the y direction means that the force of the plank is equal to the two weights. Force of the pivot is equal to the two weights. That doesn't really tell us a whole lot. So we go to the sum of the torques. Now in static equilibrium problems, we can choose to place our pivot wherever we want to. Uh, I should probably use a different word than pivot because we have a literal pivot here. But we place the axis of rotation wherever we want to. Typically in this problem, what I would do is place the axis of rotation right at the uh, pivot itself or at one of the other two forces. Why do we want to do that? Because when we do our torque equation, we want to have as few forces as possible. One thing I will mention is that all of our distances are measured from the left end. So you may be tempted to use that as the axis of rotation. If you do, that'll be fine. You just need to notice that from the sum of the forces in the y, you get that this guy is equal to the sum of those two weights. But the quickest way through is to set your pivot, you set your axis of rotation at the pivot and then sum the torques due to the two weights. Cool, all right, so uh, the uh, mass right here, a little gray square is giving us a rotation in the counterclockwise direction. So that is a positive torque and I need to do R times F. What is the R from this point to this point? They tell us that the mass was placed at X equals 0 0.2 meters. So, oh, they have X labeled right there. It'll be 0 0.2. If the pivot is 0 0.8 from the left end, and this one is 0 0.2, that gives you a difference of 0 0.6. And it's some mass M times G. The other force comes from the weight of the plank itself, which is giving us a negative torque, a clockwise torque. So that'll be minus. What is the distance from this pivot to the, from the, yeah, the fulcrum here, the pivot to the center of mass of the plank? The center of the plank is going to be at X equals one. And the pivot is placed at X equals 0 0.8. So that means that the distance between those two, one and 0.8 is 0 0.2. And then I have the mass of the uh, plank given as six. And then this whole thing, oh, and then there's a G. And then as I mentioned, the whole thing is equal to zero. And then you just solve, your Gs will cancel. We're solving for the mass here. So give us the mass is equal to uh, 0 0.2 divided by 0.1. Is that two kilograms? Okay, let's do one more problem. This is a very common exam problem. You have the, the rod that is hinged at the wall. Let's talk about the forces here. Forces that we will always have in this problem. If you have this rope, you have some tension at some angle theta. The rod has to have some mass for the physics to work, which will give you a weight. 
Finally, at the hinge, you have a couple weird things going on, which is that you have a normal force from the wall that pushes out on the hinge. And then the hinge itself, by virtue of its screws and stuff, gives you some vertical lifting force, which we'll call force of the hinge. Ultimately, in this problem, the only thing that we are really tasked with finding, though, is the horizontal force. The horizontal force is, in other words, that normal force right there. OK, let's talk about how to do this real quick. First thing that I notice is that the normal force and the tension are the two things acting in the x direction. If I sum my forces in the x direction, I get a relationship between those two. I have the normal forces in the positive x direction, all of it. And then I'd have minus the component of the tension, which would be T cosine theta. That tells me that my normal force is equal to T cosine theta. Since I noticed this from the summing of the forces, I can then perform a torque calculation where I set the axis of rotation at the wall. And then I don't need to be concerned with the other hinge forces. When I do the torques here, as I move out, my weight is giving me a negative torque. So that would be negative. The distance from the hinge to that weight is half the length, L on two, times the weight. The only other torque is going to be from the tension. That's giving me a counterclockwise rotation. So that's a positive torque. That tension is located a distance L from the hinge. And then I have T. And here's where I need to use my sine of phi, where phi is the same as that constant theta. Again, everything is in equilibrium, so this is equal to zero. Since that's equal to zero, you can cancel out the L's and you get T sine of theta is equal to W on two. You're given the mass, so the problem is essentially done from there. You just solve for T here and then plug it in right there and you have your normal force. What is the L over 2 times W? Why is that negative? Um, because the weight here is causing a rotation about the axis of rotation in the clockwise direction, which is a negative torque. So we've set our axis of rotation right here. Which means you just imagine the weight pushing you along a circle. Cool. Okay. Yeah, let me do, let me go through that one more time. I have another question in the chat about it. So, real quick, what I'm doing the summing of the torques. Each torque for some force I is R sub I, F sub I, sine of phi sub I. And there's also a positive or negative component to it. So as I'm going through, I try to do this in order. First thing I try to always ask, sorry that it's kind of ran out of room here. First thing I always try to ask is positive or negative. So I do what I just did. I say, here's my axis of rotation. For instance, for the weight force, that's going to push me around the axis of rotation like this. That's clockwise. That's a negative torque. That's where that negative sign comes from. Once I've assigned a sign to it, then I need to do my R, my distance from the axis of rotation to the force, which in this case, is just half the length of the rod because the weight will always be in the middle. So that's the L over two. And then I do times the force. That one's obviously just the weight. And then sine of phi. Well, the weight is going to be perpendicular to the plank because the plank is horizontal. So that's sine of 90, which is one. So that one is done. Now I just need to do plus or minus R sub I, F sub I, sine phi for the tension force. That's the only other one that's not located at the hinge. First of all, positive or negative, my tension is going to cause a rotation like this. That looks to be a counterclockwise rotation, which is a positive torque. So that's why I have a plus sign right here. That tension is located a distance L from the pivot all the way at the other end. So that's where this L comes from. The force itself is T. And then sine of phi, in this case, the tension is at an angle that is not 90 degrees, but I'm luckily given the angle that it as relative to the uh, beam and it's theta. So that's why I have that sine of theta right there. Is this the same type of problem as like the ladder problem? Where you have like a ladder and a circle and a wall, but just with different forces, like you wouldn't have two forces. 
Yeah, the latter problem. So let me just, there are, I think we have like a very complicated ladder problem on the homework, but the ladder problem. Yeah, so here's the thing with the ladder when you have a ladder leaning. <clears throat> the most important thing to recognize is that you have two places where there is a normal force and the potential for a force of friction. Sometimes I'll tell you it's frictionless in one location, but wherever you have contact, you're going to have a normal force, which you call like N1 and N2, and then you'd also have a force of friction. Typically, the ladder wants to slide out the, toward the right, so the force of friction would pull it to the left, and then that would also mean that it wants to slide down, so you'd have some force of friction that wants to hold it up on the wall. So wherever you have a point of contact, you can have a friction, and then of course there would also be the weight of the ladder, which will be at the center of the ladder, and then uh, you know, they could put a guy on the ladder, do whatever. Um, but generally, the way that you proceed through the ladder problem is to, again, set your pivot in a smart place. Set it either up here or down here. Hopefully, if you have it on an exam, you'd only have one friction. So you're probably going to set a pivot where the friction is, and that'll get rid of that normal force and that friction. And then also keep in mind that you always have these two tools available as well, and that both of those would be equal to zero, so long as the ladder is in equilibrium. Um, let's see, so I think, I, uh, I don't know if there's a, I think we're good on, on time. Um, I don't think there's another class coming in. Uh, I've got a couple questions. <clears throat> what are some key phrases that indicate what topic the problem's about? like statics, conservation, and momentum, et cetera. Um, yeah, so one thing that you can, you can usually tell is if we have rotation or not. So if we don't have rotation for this exam, then those are gonna be things like momentum, uh, energy, you know, conservation of, of energy and kinetic and potential energy. Um, and I think that those are probably the only topics that we have. Uh, the other non-rotation problems, these kind of seem like non-rotation problems as well, right? So you could also have a static equilibrium problem. This is technically rotation, but this, this thing is not rotating. The ladder's not rotating. It doesn't seem apparent. When you do have rotation, that usually is a little bit quicker because you can say, okay, that's going to be conservation of uh, angular momentum, um, I could have rolling kinetic energy problems and the associated conservation of energy problems. Um, or you could again have torques, but this is where you'd sum your torques instead of equal to I alpha. From here, breaking it down, notice in each of these we have a momentum. Momentum will be related oftentimes to a speed or a velocity. Also, the biggest one is a collision. Um, we also know that energy has some speed considerations as well, uh, but this is typically where we have conservation of energy. Um, if you're given a rotational inertia, that's, that's a pretty good uh, indication that you need to do something with rotation. Remember, rotational inertia is kind of included in all of these, although we typically don't use it in the, in the rolling kinetic energy. It is included in all of these topics. Um, I have no idea how hard this, uh, this semester's exam is going to be. I will say that it's um, fewer topics. It's more narrowly focused than last semester. So that is one, uh, one thing to uh, keep in mind. Can you go over energy conservation? Yeah, let's do, talk about energy conservation. So uh, there's two sort of sides to energy conservation. One of them, which we did a problem on earlier, is that the change in kinetic energy is equal to the opposite of the change in potential energy. 
which if you want to plug in your initials and finals tells you k final uh, minus k initial is equal to u initial minus u final. This is the same thing as saying your potential initial plus your kinetic initial is equal to your potential final kinetic final. In those problems, you have you know, like a rolling object that went up to a height. That was a problem that we looked at before. We wanted to find the new height. Typically, the way that I approach these problems is I just split this into my initial condition and my final condition. And I just talk about the energies that I have in each. But sort of implied in that is that you have a potential plus a kinetic in each location. For the rolling problem, I just have some kinetic initial that happens to be a rolling kinetic energy. And all of that rolling energy is going to be turned into a final potential energy. And since I'm going up to a height, that's a potential energy due to gravity. You could probably contrive something with a spring, but I've never seen it. Um, and then from here, you just have to plug in the expression. So your potential energy due to gravity will always be an mgy. And then your rolling kinetic energy would come from the 1 half mv squared plus 1 half i omega squared. Um, I typically know I want to do this if I want to find a height. I don't think we have any other tools in this exam to find a height that an object climbs to other than potential energy. Um, and also when I'm given speeds, uh, that's an indication that I want to deal with rolling kinetic energy. And when I'm given rotation, I should say. Oh, one other thing I'll say is that I guess relative velocity, that is only in the momentum chapter. So if you have a relative speed given, that's an indication that you're going to do conservation momentum. All right, I don't see any more questions. Go ahead and end it. Uh, oh, a pulley problem, like fall. Yeah, let me just like triple check the number. I don't think there's a problem. Pulley problem. Um, uh, fall 2020, number 13. Anyone else wants to pull it up? I'll try to pull it up here. Uh, fall 2020. Where are you? Here's exam two, fall 2020. <clears throat> Um, okay, so question 13, fall 2020 reads, two blocks are suspended by a cord, which is going to pass over a frictionless pulley. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so you got masses on each of the blocks. This one is actually ripped right off the homework. Y'all had this for the homework this semester. Um, slide. Nope, why do I keep doing that? So uh, you have a pulley, you have a cord connecting two masses together, M1 and M2. It's very similar to a problem that we did earlier in the semester. However, what's new is we can now incorporate the rotation action of the pulley. As we did before, we wanna say one of these is gonna go up, the other one's gonna go down. The one that's going up will have a positive acceleration when we do its force calculation. The one going down will have a negative acceleration when we do its force calculation. The bigger one's going to go down. And uh, in this problem, they tell you block two is going to fall some distance in some time. Now, they give you a distance the block moves in some time. They do not give you the acceleration. So you actually do have to do kinematics first for this problem. You have your delta y is negative 73 centimeters. So you have to convert that. And you have your time is 5.4 seconds. And uh, you'd use these with kinematics with V initial is equal to zero because they're released from rest. You'd use these together to find an acceleration. I trust you can do that. That's like step zero in this problem. Once you have that, then you can get to work on the solution to the problem. And there's gonna be quite a bit going on here. So we have the forces on each of these guys. And then we're also going to have the torques on the pulley itself. So a force for M1, a force for M2, a torque for pulley, that'll give you three equations. Let's look at the forces. We have tension T1 
acting up on block one. And then we have M1G going down. <clears throat> For block two, we have tension two pulling up and then M2G pulling down. Previously, when we did this problem, the tension was constant in the rope because there was no mass in the pulley. Now that there is some mass in the pulley, that will distribute the tensions unevenly between the two blocks. But we do know that in each of these rope segments, you'll have the same tension. So like this is also tension one, and this is also tension two on the pulley. And that's how you relate the masses to the pulleys. All right, let's go ahead and do our, our calculation for the forces. Summing the forces on block one, we have tension one up, minus M1G down is equal to M1 times A, where we have a positive acceleration. Summing the forces on block two is gonna give you a very similar equation. The only difference is that block two has a negative acceleration. So I have P2 minus M2G is equal to M2 times negative A. And that gives me two equations. I know the acceleration. Uh, so yeah, so this problem where I know the acceleration, I can find tension T1 and T2 immediately from those equations. Ultimately, the problem is gonna ask me for the rotational inertia of the pulley. Well, I know that's not gonna come from the forces. Where's my rotational inertia gonna come from? That's gotta come from the torques, which is always gonna be related to forces. It's the only way to relate forces to rotation. So sum my torques on the pulley. I have given a direction for alpha, I've said that this is the direction for alpha. And uh, you'll see that that is actually a clockwise rotation that's gonna be a negative alpha. What will be the signs for each of my torques here? I have T1, which is pulling the pulley in this direction. That's counterclockwise, that'll be a positive torque. And the distance from the center to that force is just the radius of the pulley. So just as a reminder, I have plus or minus, R sub i, F sub i, sine B sub i. <clears throat> so T1 gives me counterclockwise rotations at the positive. What is my R sub i for T1? It's just the radius of the pulley. What is the force? T1. What is the sine of B? 90 degrees, because it is a tangential force. So a sine of 90 is one. My other force, tension T2, is causing rotation in the other direction. The clockwise rotation means we have a negative torque, so it'll be a minus. What is my R for T2, my R sub I? It's also R, the radius of the pulley. And then what is my force, T2? Sine of B is sine of 90, which is one. And then I can set this equal to that rotational inertia. And just to make sure I'm being consistent with my signs, although it doesn't make a ton of difference in this problem, I'm gonna go ahead and say that alpha is negative as well. The only really important negative sign is right here, but how are you supposed to know that? So just keep your signs all the same. <clears throat> um, yeah, and then that's actually, the problem is done right there. So we have T1 and T2 from these first two equations, and then you plug those in, you plug in your radius. Uh, oh, and then the last thing is, what do I do with alpha? I don't have an alpha but I do know that my accelerations and my alphas are always related with A is equal to R alpha. So in other words, alpha is A on R and it'll be big R, the radius of the pulley, because that acceleration is located at the rope and the rope happens to be strung around the outside of the pulley. There's another old exam problem where you have a pulley with a radius big R and then there's like an inner wheel and the rope is actually wrapped around, that's not what I meant to do. The rope is actually wrapped around the inner wheel, which has a radius like little r, right? And there's my rope. In that case, your forces would be located at little r because your tensions are at little r. And also your acceleration here, uh, here would use a little r. Uh, the difference would be if they asked you to calculate an inertia to plug in, you'd have to use big R for the inertia. That's just like a very like fringe. I think when that was an exam problem, it was a homework problem as well. 
So uh, I wouldn't worry about that one too much, but just to keep in mind when when you're supposed to use what are they? Yeah, yeah. Uh, for this problem, they're asking for the rotational inertia, so we actually need to solve for i. And this was a homework problem too. You have any other problems or any questions? It's on the 2015. 20, which one? Uh, 2015. 2015? It's got like three. I think it's like 17 or something. It's got like three pulleys. It's all connected. Okay. Oh, oh, yes. I actually remember that one. Uh, 2015. Probably spring 2015. 2015 number. Uh, number 18, yes. Um, okay, so in this problem, there's a guy with a bunch of pulleys. There's just a whole mess of pulleys. We have one pulley hanging from the roof. We have another rotating pulley, a uh, free pulley. And then attached to that is another rope wrapped around another pulley. And that pulley has a weight attached to it. And uh, let's see, here's another rope. And then that rope is being pulled on by a person. And uh, they give you his weight, which is like his pulling force. They tell you that he can pull down with 75 Newtons. And they want to know how big of a weight he can support. So uh, in this problem, these pulleys do not have mass. They don't have rotational inertia, which means that the tensions in all of these ropes will be constant. So he's going to apply a force on this rope. And that force is going to carry through that same rope everywhere we look. And we don't actually care about this, this top pulley that's uh, held up by the uh, attached to the ceiling um, because there's not another pulley attached to it. The real troublemaker is this guy right here. And uh, what we see is that the same rope is slung around that pulley. So it's going to have two of that guy's 75 Newton forces pulling it up. This, this was a homework problem, I think. And that means that the downward force on the other side is going to be equal to two times F. So you have 2F going up. That means that that pulley can support 2F below it. And what it is supporting is this other rope that is strung around our third pulley. And again, since we have no inertia, that means that we also have 2F acting up on both sides of our hanging pulley. So your two vertical forces are both 2F. And that means that your weight can at most be equal to 2F plus 2F. So your weight is equal to 4F. There's like a formula that you can use. I think it's just uh, that like this weight is equal to two times the number of free pulleys, so long as the pulleys are free. So they could also give you one where there's like 18 pulleys and one of them is attached to the ceiling. They do two times 17. Any other questions? It's like only a couple of people left online. <clears throat> All right, I think I'm gonna go ahead and wrap it up then. Um, good luck everyone. Um, if there happens to be anybody in my Tuesday sections, we will have section tomorrow, but we don't have anything to go over. So, um, you know, I don't know. I, I have to do it though, but uh, I'll see y'all there, I guess. Okay, stop that.